Good evening and thank you for joining us. I'd like just to look at one verse tonight and it's found in John's Gospel chapter 3 and verse 14. So John's Gospel chapter 3 and verse 14 and the scripture says and as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. The first half of John chapter 3 records a very interesting conversation, a dialogue between two men. One of them is Jesus of Nazareth, the Lord Jesus Christ. The other one is a man called Nicodemus. And we know from verse 10 that he was a master or a teacher of Israel. So he was a high-ranking Jew. And he comes to speak to the Lord Jesus at night. This conversation takes place during the night, possibly because Nicodemus didn't want to be seen with this controversial rabbi, so he comes at night time to find out more about him. He's a member of the Sanhedrin, he's a Pharisee, and he's an important Jew. And most of these groups had no time for Jesus of Nazareth. They saw him as a threat, they saw him as a nuisance, they were envious of him, and they really wanted rid of him. But Nicodemus, thankfully, is different. He's interested in the person of Christ. And he comes... And he says that he saw him as a teacher come from God, for no man can do these miracles. He'd heard his teaching maybe, and he'd seen his miracles, and he wanted to find out more. Nicodemus has got a lot to learn, not just about the way of salvation, but more importantly really about the one who he met that night, the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. <clears throat> so the conversation continues uh, and in verse 14, the Lord refers back to an event that took place in Israel's history. And this is an event that Nicodemus would have known about. He was a man who was an expert on the Old Testament scriptures. And he would have known exactly this event the Lord Jesus was talking about. And the event is described there in verse 14 as, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness. That's the event the Lord Jesus refers back to here. In verse 14, that seems strange. What's this talking about? What's this event all about? Well, you can go way back to the book of Numbers and read about this event, Numbers chapter 21. And at that period in Israel's history, they had left Egypt. And remember, they were slaves in Egypt for all these years. And then they crossed the Red Sea and they went into the wilderness and they spent 40 years wandering there because of their sin and their disobedience. And when you get to Numbers chapter 21, we're towards the end of the wilderness journey, almost 40 years, and the people fall into sin and disobedience again. Sin is something the Bible treats very seriously from Genesis to Revelation. The Bible takes it very, very seriously. God is love. We know that and we're thankful for that. But God is also holy and he's just. And he's a sin-hating God. And the Bible never wavers in that from Genesis to Revelation. It's always the same. God cannot overlook sin. He can't sweep under the carpet. You see, all sin is ultimately against the living God. Every single sin that we commit. And all sin has to be punished. Again, something the Bible makes clear from Genesis to Revelation. And that's exactly what happens on this occasion as well. In Numbers chapter 21. The people sin, punishment is brought upon them, and in this case, it's fiery serpents that are sent into the camp. Whether these were some kind of serpent that was highly venomous or some kind of supernatural snake for the event, I don't really know. But all we know is they were fiery serpents that were sent into the camp, and they bit the people. And if you were bitten, it was certain death. It was a death sentence. <clears throat> Moses comes between the people and God and intercedes and pleads and prays for mercy and for deliverance. And God tells Moses to do something quite strange. He tells him to form a serpent out of brass or bronze and attach it to a pole and to lift it up in the camp. And there was a simple instruction. All you had to do was look at it. If you'd been bitten, you looked at the serpent on the pole and you would lift. If you refused to look, you would die. It was as simple as that. So that was a historical event in Israel's history. And the Lord refers back to it here in verse 
14. <clears throat> but then he says, as that serpent was lifted up, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. So what's he talking about here? Who's the Son of Man? Well, the Son of Man is a title of the Lord Jesus. There are so many titles, there's dozens of titles describing the person and the work of the Lord Jesus. One would not suffice. There are so many wonderful titles. I am the Alpha and Omega. So many you can look at in your spare time. But here's a title, and this was the most used title the Lord Jesus used it most of himself, the Son of Man, most frequently. First and foremost, in face value, it speaks of his humanity. Other scriptures prove his deity. You know, John's Gospel was written to prove the deity of Christ. These things are written that you may, might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, John could say. And there are many scriptures that prove that Jesus of Nazareth was the Son of the living God. He was God manifest in the flesh. But he was also 100% man, sin apart. And that's a big difference. He was sin apart. We know that he was born in Bethlehem, he was raised in Nazareth, he lived in a community for almost 30 years. We see him in the Gospels sleeping, he's hungry, he's weary with a journey, he's thirsty. We see him weeping at the graveside, things that we all do in our humanity. He was so like us in every possible way, yet he was also so different because he was absolutely sinless. And the Bible from Genesis to Revelation makes it clear that we are all sinners, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Even the best living amongst us, we fall short of God's perfect standard. The Lord Jesus didn't, but we do. We fall short, we need a saviour. The Bible presents us as being lost. But the good news of the gospel is that the Son of Man, and there's that title again, the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost, and that is us in our sins. But you know, that meant the cross. The Lord Jesus had to come and suffer and die and pay the price. And that's what it's referring to here in verse 14. The Son of Man must be lifted up. The Son of Man came to seek and to save, but the Son of Man must be lifted up. And here the Lord Jesus clearly predicts the cross, which is shortly going to happen to him. The Saviour is going to be lifted up. That's what happened when a person was crucified. What a terrible, horrific way to die, to be nailed to a cross. But then that cross was lifted up and everyone could gaze at the person upon the cross. So the lift up, lifted up serpent in the wilderness, that was hope for those who were bitten. It was a death sentence they had, but that could be reprieved if they looked at the serpent in the pole. The lifted up saviour, that's hope for the sinner, that's hope for you and for me. You see, sin demands payment. The wages of sin is death. It's a price that must be paid. Punishment has to fall upon the sinner. But at the cross, the sinless one bore the punishment. He met the righteous requirements, demands, of a thrice holy God. The Bible tells us that he died the just for the unjust. He's made a way back to God. The gospel message demands a response as the serpent in the wilderness required the response. You had to look or you didn't look. You made your choice and the gospel is a choice as well. You either reject this message completely or you accept it fully. You repent of your sins, repentance towards God and faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. So you have to repent of your sin and believe in the Lord Jesus. And that's just not about him as a historical figure. That is putting your faith, your trust, your hope, everything in the person of the Lord Jesus, pinning all of your hopes, your eternal hopes on him. You see, we cannot rest on anything else. On Christ, the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. The hymn writer has said. So what about this man Nicodemus? He's quite an interesting character. Did he believe? Well, you only read about Nicodemus three times and he's found in John's Gospel on these three occasions. This is the first time in chapter three he comes to the Lord Jesus by night as that maybe sceptical but interested 
Pharisee finding out more about Jesus of Nazareth. Then in chapter 7, <clears throat> he publicly defends the Lord, um, which would have cost him something. And there's a little bit of a backlash to him there in chapter 7, but it's interesting, he seems to be making progress. But then in chapter 19, he joins another, uh, Joseph of Arimathea, in a wonderful act. And they get permission to take the body of Christ down from the cross. You can read about it in John chapter 19. And this man, remember this is the man who first heard these words, the Son of Man must be lifted up. This is the very man who actually takes the body of Christ down from the cross. And they take him to that prepared tomb with all the spices and they give Christ the burial of a king. That of course would have cost Nicodemus financially, but you know it would have cost him a lot more. This really was a break with Judaism. This was him really nailing his colours to the mast and showing whose side he was on, the person of Christ. I'm 100% sure that Nicodemus was a believer in the Lord Jesus. Well, what about you? Like Nicodemus, the fact that you're maybe watching this video shows that you've got some kind of interest in the person of Christ, and that is good. But you know you have to take it further. You have to put your faith and trust in Christ. You see, Christ is the answer, not only to Earth's deepest questions, to our deepest questions, why we're here, where we came from, where are we going, He's also the answer to our deepest needs. For no one will be in heaven unless they're sheltered by the blood of Christ and have him as their saviour. I do hope you might think these things over. This is a very, very important, this is the biggest issue that we can face. Where will we spend eternity? Thank you very much for listening.